Okay, on the behalf of the EPFL Wish Foundation, welcome to everyone, welcome to the 2021 Erna Hamburger Prize Ceremony. Uh, we are delighted that we are able to hold this ceremony here in person at the EPFL Forum Rolex, and we are very happy to see you all here. It's a refreshing uh, sight. Now, without further ado, I would like to leave the podium to, to have a, an introductory word from our EPFL Vice President for Academic Affairs, Jan Estaven. Thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, so let me first of all, on behalf of, uh, of the president and also myself, uh, welcome you to, to this event, uh, the Erna Hamburger Award Ceremony. Uh, and before we do uh, a presentation of, of this year's laureate, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on, on reminding us uh, why we're here. Uh, and then it will also become very clear why uh, this year's Lord, uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert, uh, embodies the idea of the award uh, perfectly. So Erna Hamburger was born in, in 1911 in Brussels, in Belgium, and, and in fact attended what uh, was uh, IPUL, so Ecole Polytechnique, uh, the University of Lausanne, which in 1969 became EPFL. And she graduated with her PhD in 1936. But the big uh, uh, thing to, of course, keep in mind here is that in 1957, she became the first professor, the first female professor, uh, at any of the two uh, ETH domain institutions. Um, she was a professor in electrometry, which is not something that we do today, but this is the science of uh, electric measurements. Um, and throughout her entire life, she fought for gender equality and for women's right to higher education uh, and professional choices. And in 1998, when she passed away, shortly thereafter, um, the Anna Hamburger Foundation was created uh, to honor uh, her contributions to gender equality uh, and access to higher education uh, for women. Uh, all over. Now, apparently in 1957, when she was appointed, uh, the president at that time, uh, Maurice Cossendry, is, is to have said, it is both a brilliant consecration and a measure of the backwardsness that characterizes our country as regards to the promotion of women. Uh, uh, he could perhaps also have said that today, in Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland leads in many areas. Gender equality maybe is not one of them. But we are trying, and we are making progress. And, and certainly from the point of view of PFL, uh, in the last 10 years, we have more than doubled the relative number of women on our faculty. The numbers are still small. It is slightly above 20%. Um, but now, uh, more than 45% of offers in the last four years have been made to female candidates for, pro for professorial appointments. And in fact, EPFL has a policy which is quite unique in that the goal is that 40% of all first offers to professorial appointments must be made to women. And, uh, and in the last three years, uh, which is the time since the policy was introduced, we have reached that number. Uh, so more than 40% of all first offers are made to women and uh, uh, a high number of these appointments are eventually made. Uh, I'll give you one example, which is an outlier, but it's a good one. Uh, at the last uh, session of the COPF, which is where we ultimately, where professors are appointed, 83% of all appointees were women from EPFL. Uh, so that's a very high number. I don't know that we can do this every, every time, but uh, at least it shows that we are uh, on the right path, uh, the EPFL direction is uh, entirely gender balanced, 
could say for an institution like Oxford, this is perhaps not unusual. We are a different kind of institution uh, focused on science and technology. Uh, and at least here and also in Zurich, our sister institution, this is uh, unique. There's still a lot to do. And this is why the words of Kosendi is, is uh, worth keeping in mind. Um, the promotion of women and diversity in general is something which is an important uh, priority for the direction for the president uh, during this four-year period. Um, and also, as, as many of you know, uh, we have appointed a vice president for responsible transformation, Professor Kisu Wendergut, and one of her uh, specific uh, areas of responsibility is diversity and minority um, improvement of minority conditions at EPFL, gender, uh, and on other kinds of minorities. So, so we are making progress, uh, and, uh, and I hope that, uh, that Kosandi would, would agree with that. So every year, uh, we now uh, um, remember Anna Hamburger by awarding a prize uh, for what we consider to be the most influential woman in science of that particular year. Uh, and uh, this year's laureate, as you will quickly uh, experience, certainly uh, qualifies for that title but I will leave that to others to discuss her impressive career and her accomplishments. So welcome, and uh, hopefully we'll all have a good time. Thank you very much, Jan, for these encouraging figures. We do expect you to continue going down that path. 83, <laughs> if you go down, it's going to be trouble. OK. Now, on the behalf of the EPFL WISH Foundation, I would like to uh, take a few minutes to tell you about this foundation and what we do. And as I said, I speak on the behalf of everyone and the number of uh, members are here, and in particular Alexandra Radenovic, who helped a great deal for this event. So, this is a foundation that was uh, created in 2006 by a group of female professors. Uh, many of them are still helping us in the board and bureau. And it is actually a financially independent foundation. And so, as you can read, independently, we encourage the research and promotion of women. And how do we do it? We try to provide role models, financial support, networking, uh, tools, and we try to do it at the important moment in the career of these young women, both at the PFL and, as you will see, also abroad. Um, so the EPFL WISH Foundation consists of two bodies, the board and the bureau, and here are the members of the two bodies that equally contribute to the activities of the foundation. Now, all these people contribute, volunteer their time to achieve the mission of the foundation. And without their time and commitment, we would not be able to do anything. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your time and commitment and for making this possible. Now, we have a number of activities that we carry out, and so let me just summarize a few of them. The one, for example, is the master's project abroad. And so here, what we do, we give financial support up to 6,000 Swiss francs to uh, young master's students who have been accepted to carry out their master project abroad and they are academically interested and, uh, uh, to move in this direction. 
So this is an experience that provides a global perspective, uh, an international experience, networking. It also uh, helps them uh, create a certain confidence in themselves. So since 2006, we have awarded more than 65 fellowships. And just last year, in this year actually, in April 2021, we uh, awarded four students with this fellowship. We typically have two call per year, and so we are going to have, again, one before the end of the year. And as you can see, uh, these uh, young students are going to very good universities to carry out their master projects. Another activity that we do is women in science luncheons. And uh, in this case, the uh, PhD, master, and postdoc uh, women have an opportunity to interact with uh, role models in both academia and in industry in an informal setting where they can ask questions about career, about how to move forward, etc. One event is the one that we are, you are attending right now, which is the Erna Hamburger Prize. Jan spent already time on this, so let me just say that every year we, chose, we choose an influential uh, scientist, female scientist, for her uh, achievements in, uh, in STEM. And this is, of course, uh, to pay respect in the name of Erna Hamburger, that is, was the first female to, be, to receive the position of professor in a STEM university in Switzerland. We also have workshops that uh, we run. Uh, once again, these are opportunities for both typically female, but some of these events are open to everyone, and here are a few examples of past events which have taken place this year. Now, our activities will not be possible without the financial support of our sponsors. And here, let me just flash them out. Uh, for each of our activities, we rely uniquely on a sponsor, and let me take this opportunity to thank them very much for their support and for their donation that make all of this possible. Now, uh, I would like to therefore present you a video on the impact of COVID, which has been realized by Alexandre Pinault, and as you will see, is on the impact of COVID on students. from very good uh, hopes to big, big despair. But now that the vaccine gave us the possibility to move forward a bit with our lives, it's, it means everything to me. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Marine Claudet. I'm a former life sciences engineering student from PFL. I'm Alix, I'm 24 years old and I'm currently finishing my master's degree at EPFL in microengineering. My name is Mukesh Chand Thakur and I'm a PhD student at EPFL. So when COVID started, I was in my last semester of EPFL courses. In 2020, I applied to a master thesis project at Harvard University that was about exoskeletons and how we can use them uh, in rehabilitation for patients suffering from strokes or spinal cord injuries. I remember my teacher saying as a joke that he was uh, preparing video recordings of his courses just in case. And I remember everyone was laughing in the class and I remember my exact feeling of thinking he was way too dramatic and that the situation would never happen. No one was thinking that it could be an actual option, an actual situation. Since it, would, it was my last semester of courses, I had to decide where to do my master thesis afterwards. It was initially planned to be done in Boston, in the US, but um, after a while I decided that uh, it would be safer for me to, to um, 
take up a master thesis uh, here at TPFL. So um, after a bit of struggle, I, um, I could organize that. And finally, I was uh, able to perform a super nice master thesis uh, at Siemens Athenius at the EP EPFL Innovation Park and uh, obtained my, uh, my diploma uh, last year. And at this time it was kind of scary because we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know if the course um, would be valid or not, uh, the grades valid or not. It was kind of uncertain and especially because we can see that uh, the teachers uh, were lost too. So honestly, in the beginning of the year 2020, we used to discuss a lot about this uh, disease, this pneumonia just spreading across uh, different countries. Uh, but it really didn't really hit us until the end of February when it was actually at our doorsteps. I think this was the first uh, case registered in Switzerland. And yeah, after that we all know what happened. During the two first months of COVID and clearly only during those two uh, months, I can say that I kind of enjoy COVID times. It was kind of a relief at first having more time for yourself, doing things that uh, you usually procrastinate. And especially, I, th I think, being away from this everyday rush. I think that at first, I was kind of happy. I was doing my studies when uh, the pandemic uh, reached uh, Europe in like February or March uh, 2020. Uh, like the campus closed and we had to do the courses remotely. So uh, I was uh, living in Lausanne in a flat share with other students. I decided to go back to France to live with my family. It was a, a bit of a struggle at that time. We had to follow the courses at EPFL remotely. We had the videos and everything. We had all the, um, the material we needed to succeed in our studies. But it was uh, maybe tougher to get the motivation to study. The beginning of the quarantine was quite stressful for me, majorly because we didn't know how long that quarantine was going to last. You were worried constantly about your family who are living like continent away from you. You are worried about yourself, worried about your research, and everything was halted, you couldn't go anywhere. And at that point, we did not have vaccine. So it was a very, very anxious state of uh, moment for me and quite stressful. But when the time I was going and going, you realize that you, you miss really the people, the student life, going into the hallway and meeting new people, having lunch with your friends. But then you really miss having people around you. And especially when you're a student, when you leave EPFL, it's nice to have those last times, last courses, last grades, last exams. It was harder because it was my last semester too. Because I was not gonna stay alone in my flat in Lausanne. This was very tough because I, I remember that I was really happy about beginning my last semester at PFL. I had a lot of projects in mind. I really wanted to, you know, have fun and make the most of my experience. And the restrictions in France were really tough. We had to have that paper with us all the time to say uh, at what time we left home and uh, on what purpose. So it it felt a bit like we were yeah, stuck inside. Despite of that, we really had to follow the, the courses at EPFL. Talking about online courses, I really found it difficult to follow during the semester, despite the fact that EPFL has an amazing job for online courses and Zoom sessions. I really missed the students in the classroom when you can easily ask your neighbor a question and also when you see people working together it uh, motivates you to work more but at the end of the day it's only you and the computer so last year during quarantine i remember all the associations at aplfl were having online events i think that that was very refreshing for the students and for all of us because it kept on the feeling of uh, community and uh, that was good to have a motivating environment during these uh, depressing times. Uh, one very positive point is that the organization of that university was perfect. So we, we had all the material that we needed to, to succeed in our exams. So we had the online videos, we had often question and answers that we could attend to to really also have a chat with the teachers or the other students 
collaborating with other students and it really helped me move on and go through this pandemic without uh, feeling too lonely. And I decided to get enrolled in a mentoring program. So it's master's students helping first year students to stay motivated and to answer questions about the student life, but also courses. And so the second semester was uh, so much better. Um, I decided to continue with this mentoring program with the same group uh, for the second semester. We were able to meet up, uh, to meet um, with the old group, uh, doing revision sessions on campus, we did uh, dinners and picnic by the lake with the whole group and it was really amazing after the, the whole semester seeing them online, just uh, having them uh, in real life, it was really amazing and uh, we're still very good friends now and we have a WhatsApp group where we still talk, so um, I really enjoy uh, this experience. It's very good to be on campus now, now that we are, we are fully vaccinated. So it's really, really good and refreshing to see, you know, people on campus and not on the virtual world. <laughs> I can't remember if they were FDA approved already or not. And I thought, OK, this is like the only hope that we have to get through this pandemic, go back to real life. Maybe that's a bit too soon to talk about that. But this was really the, the hope that we had. And I thought, please make it fast. Honestly, it has been a real big uh, hope to stick to. So I was already very impressed about how fast everything uh, came. As soon as the COVID vaccine was released for my group age, I think I took the earliest slot available. I got vaccinated because I knew that it was an actual passport for my master project to happen. Nowadays, people are still not alone on campus, on the Stanford campus, if they are not vaccinated. So I can really say that the vaccine changed my life, as I'm pretty sure that without it, uh, my master project would have been postponed again. But now that the vaccine gave us the possibility to move forward a bit with our lives, it means everything to me. And this wouldn't have been possible without the vaccine for sure. So I'm so grateful and glad that I can at least enjoy these last moments of my student life. You have lectures and you can experiment in the lab in, in person. At the same time, you have meetings and all those things on Zoom. So that's the hybrid life and I think it's a new normal. What quarantine taught me is that don't take anything for granted. We have to be very uh, careful about our environment. The environment is changing and we should also think about our lifestyle change. I think it's about hard time. And the third and the most important thing is just be grateful for your life. Those uh, past six months has been uh, a roller coaster of emotions from very good uh, hopes to big, big despair. But now that the vaccine gave us the possibility to move forward a bit with our lives, it, it means everything to me. After three American visa, after a long waiting time, uh, after some despair, some hopes, I can, uh, I am so happy to say uh, that I am living in two days to Stanford. Uh, I started living my life a bit um, like I used to live it earlier. So the, um, as the borders reopened, for instance, during summer, I could travel uh, with my friends, with my family all around uh, Europe, at least in Italy and Spain. And it was uh, really a relief. And uh, we started to have uh, hope again for uh, our, our projects and, and uh, future. It's very good to be on campus now, now that we are, we are fully vaccinated. So it's really, really good and refreshing to see you know, people on campus and not on the virtual world. <laughs> for me, the WISH uh, Foundation represents a really nice opportunity for women in science to launch their career. Um, in my personal case, um, they provided me a grant to fund my master thesis, which was really a, a nice help and support that I appreciated and that allowed me to, uh, to finish my studies. And finally, I really want to thank a lot the WISH Foundation from which I received a scholarship for my master project. You, you are really the reason why I am able to go to Stanford University and work in my dream laboratory. 
Uh, and it's not only about a financial support, but also I really appreciate the support you uh, are giving to women in such a field as engineering. And I really felt honored that you trust my capacity to succeed as um, a woman in, uh, in engineering. Uh, so for this, thank you so much. Very good. So following a tradition that we started a few years ago, uh, we are going to have an EPFL master student to introduce the laureate. And so it is with great pleasure which I invite here to the podium Charlene Burki uh, to introduce uh, Professor Dame Sarah Gilbert. Good evening, everyone. It is awesome to see so many of us gathered here today after the past 18 turbulent months that we had. My name is Charlene Berkey, and I am a master's student here at EPFL pursuing a life science engineering with a minor in data science. I'm currently in my last semester of courses here on campus, and I am very grateful to be able to do that. A big shift from interminable Zoom sessions after moving to Switzerland from the United States in 2015, I passed the infamous prep year to EPFL CMS before beginning my Bachelor in Life Sciences. The flexibility of EPFL's master program then allowed me to conciliate my interest in life sciences and informatics. Um, and since then, I've had the privilege of working on projects at the interface between these two fields, notably in nutrigenetics and currently on digital epidemiology. During my studies here, I've had the great pleasure of meeting inspiring, hardworking classmates, creating loyal friendships, and leading student representation in life sciences. And let's not forget, learning to take the time to wind down at SAT, our on-campus bar. The greatest lesson that my years at EPFL have taught me is to value everyone's contribution, large or small, whether it be an administrator making the time to see you or a professor taking a Zoom call to make sure that you understood the course material correctly. It's the sum of all of these contributions that make up the core of EPFL and that allows us to develop, grow, and always aim a little bit higher, especially in a field vastly populated, populated by our male counterparts. It is women scientists such as Professor Erna Hamburger, a humble forward thinker that inspires us to follow greater opportunities. Erna Hamburger was promoted to the rank of full professor at EPFL in 1967 and dedicated her life to encouraging young women to follow scientific careers and break the glass ceiling. Her legacy is still visible today through the EPFL Wish Foundation, which incubates the potential of women in science at every level, from master programs and on. The foundation supports women at key women in their path through financial assistance, networking opportunities, and solidarity support. It is committed to reducing the dropout rates of women throughout their studies and professional careers. This way, it is a tad easier for women to be justly recognized for their work and accomplishments so that events such as those that happened to Rosaline Franklin and her famous Photo 51 in the discovery of the double helix DNA structure may never occur again. Central to the EPFL Wish Foundation is the Erna Hamburger Prize, which each year recognizes a leading woman scientist that through her career and contribution to science has distinguished herself and gone above and beyond to catalyze change in her field. This year, the foundation is awarding the prize to Professor Dame Sarah Gilbert, Said Professor of Vaccinology at the Jenner Institute from Oxford 
University for her outstanding work on the vaccine of SARS-CoV-2 produced by AstraZeneca. She joined Oxford University in 1994 and later in 2005, the Jenner Institute at the time of its foundation. It is there that she began her work to prepare tools for a potential disease X, a term coined by the World Health Organization to describe a hypothetical unknown pathogen that could cause a future epidemic. She also has experience in developing vaccines against Ebola, the Nipah virus, and MERS. This allowed Professor Gilbert and her team to design Oxford's COVID-19 vaccine on January 11, 2020, the very same day that the full genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was released. Almost a year later to the day, the first vaccine dose was administered in the United Kingdom. Since the beginning of 2021, she has been awarded honors and distinctions throughout the world, notably receiving the Alberts Medal from the Royal Society of Arts and being named as one of Bloomberg's 50 most influential people of 2020. Perhaps also as a sign of the shift in the world's perception of successful women in sciences, Mattel has designed a Barbie doll after her. It is with great honor and pleasure that I now present to you Professor Dame Sarah Gilbert, the 2021 recipient of the EPFL Wish Erna Hamburger Award. So after all this time, still struggling with the masks. It's, it's wonderful to be here today in person. Um, this is the first trip uh, that I've made since the end of 2019, when I was um, in Singapore discussing Nipah vaccine development. And little did we know that it was going to be a long time before we had the opportunity to, to travel again. So uh, other than a short trip to Scotland, this is the first time I've been very far from home. Um, and I think having to relearn how, how we used to do everything. Um, some of it comes back naturally, other things like remembering to pack portable chargers um, don't come so naturally quite, but we'll, we'll get there. We're, we all have to relearn things um, in order to, to get back to life as we used to know it, but maybe as in the video, maybe we don't want to get back to life completely as it used to be in the past. Maybe we want to keep some of the things that we've learned and that we've been able to do. And I think there's, we should take some time to reflect on that. So what I'm going to do uh, now is just take you quite quickly through, and I don't, I can see a clock um, which is giving me 75 minutes, so I think I, I won't take that amount of time. Um, probably about 25 minutes to go through um, what we did in the development of the vaccine uh, that we started work on at the beginning of January 2020. So um, we called it Chadox one ncov 19 I'll tell you what Chadox one is in a moment. ncov 19 comes from novel coronavirus of 2019. Um, and whenever we start making a vaccine, we have to give it a name which does not change down to the spacing, down to the hyphens, down to the capitalization of the letters. Once we start it, it keeps exactly that same name through its GMP manufacturing. You can't have things that being slightly different. But when AstraZeneca came on board, they called it AZD1222. And then when it was licensed, the EMA decided to call it Chalix 1S, which doesn't please me because that's very non-specific. We already had a MERS vaccine in development, which is a spike protein also. And how you tell that that's got anything to do with coronavirus um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, I don't know. Um, AstraZeneca decided to call it Vaxevria after it was licensed, and in S India, where Serum Institute of India are manufacturing very large numbers of doses, it's referred to as Covishield. But it's all the same vaccine. So, I need to tell you a bit about the, the technology. So, the reason vaccine development was able to go so quickly in 2020 was because vaccine developers were using what we call platform technologies. And this is different from the way that vaccines used to be developed in the past. So previously, the record for the fastest vaccine development was held by Maurice Hilleman, who worked for Merck, making a mumps vaccine in the 1960s. And to do this, he started by taking a swab of the mumps virus from his daughter's throat, and he took it into his lab. 
And there he used various tricks that he knew to attenuate the virus, make it less dangerous, but still able to produce an immune response. So he passaged it in chicken's eggs, he passaged it in cell cultures, and it took two years to reach the point where he was happy to begin clinical trials with this vaccine because he was starting from a pathogen and trying to convert it into a vaccine. And he then um, started clinical trials which actually involved fairly small numbers of children, um, but two years after that, the vaccine was licensed for use. Now, if you're going to start developing a vaccine from the pathogen itself, it's going to take a long time because you're reinventing the wheel. You're maybe using some tricks you know to, to make the virus less dangerous, but you have to work out when you've achieved that point, when it's still going to be capable of being produ produced at large scale and able to induce immune responses, but uh, is not going to be dangerous anymore. And you can only do that by a lot of testing before you then start doing clinical trials. And then you have to see if the immune response that's, that's produced is strong enough to protect against the disease. What we do now is use technologies that we know are good ways of inducing immune responses against particular diseases. And then we just add to that technology the particular protein antigen that we want the immune response against. So for the RNA vaccines, the technology is to use a stabilized form of RNA expressing the antigen of choice, and then it's encapsulated in lipid for delivery. And for um, adenoviral vector vaccines, which is what we've worked on in Oxford for a long time, we have um, the simian adenoviruses, which uh, we have made replication deficient. So we've taken one of the genes out of the adenovirus, and now it can't spread through the body when we vaccinate somebody with it. It infects the first cell it finds, it makes lots of the spike protein or whatever gene we put into it, but then it stops, it can't go any further. So it's very safe to use in people who even have no functional immune system. Um, what we do then is we add in the gene for the antigen that we want to produce, and that enables that to be um, targeted at any particular um, pathogen that we want to make a vaccine against. So we've taken out some genes to make it safer, we put in the gene to make it specific. Um, why are we using a simian adenovirus? An adenovirus was isolated from a chimpanzee, so adenoviruses normally cause mild respiratory infections in humans. There are lots of different serotypes, we all get infected with them throughout life and we say we have a cold, we don't know that we have an adenovirus infection. But because that happens, and people have had an adenovirus infection which has spread through the body and their immune system has had to make a strong response to control it, that means if we use a human adenovirus to start our vaccine development, we've already got antibodies against that adenovirus which can reduce the ability of the vaccine then to induce a new immune response. So we use uh, an adenovirus which was isolated from chimpanzees rather than humans uh, because people haven't been infected with it before. It's, it was isolated decades ago. It's been through um, complete molecular re-derivation. We don't start with a chimpanzee. We start with a piece of DNA that's been produced in bacteria. And that's what we use to add in our new gene to so that we can make a new vaccine. But it is still a live virus when we vaccinate with it. So it does two things that we need to do to get an immune response. It delivers the antigen that we want the immune response against. It's encoded in the adenovirus. It's produced after vaccination. But because it's a live viral infection, even though very short-lived, it adds the danger signal that tells the immune system, come and look at this, take notice of this new protein, do something about it, this is dangerous, you have to react to it. If you just inject pure recombinant protein into somebody, you don't get a very strong immune response because you're missing that danger signal. If you encode that protein in a live virus, you get the danger signal as well as the protein and the immune system responds to that. So we get antibody responses and we get T cell responses and we get immune memory formed and that lasts um, for a long time. And we'd been using this technology for um, a number of years. Uh, we'd been developing it, taking it into clinical trials, working out how to manufacture it. We'd done 12 um, clinical trials, early phase clinical trials before the pandemic. Uh, we'd vaccinated 330 people with Chalux-1 vector vaccines, but more broadly with other simian adenovirus vector vaccines. There had been trials of over 6,000 people at that time, including all age groups from infants to people over the age of 80. And the safety profile was good. There was strong immunogenicity even after one dose. And most relevant to the, the um, coronavirus vaccine development, we've been working on a vaccine against Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, which is also a coronavirus. That had been in clinical trials, again, showing um, 
that the, the safety was acceptable and we got strong immune responses, but we'd also done challenge studies with non-human primates at um, NIH in the US. So monkeys have been vaccinated and then deliberately exposed to MERS coronavirus and it showed they were protected against infection. So we had good data to start from when we found out that there was a new coronavirus spreading around the world and that we might need a vaccine against it. And the initial conversations were about is there human to human transmission confirmed? Do we think we need to do something? And then moving on to, well, we don't know if this is really going to be needed, but unless we start quickly, we'll be behind. So we have to start straight away. And that's what we did. And then the project expanded because we had to keep... Um, sorry, the slides are not advancing now. Uh, I think I might have lost some connection here. I don't know if I can do it. So I'll, I'll just carry on talking while you're trying to, to sort that out. So what I'm going to show you next is some of the immunology data from the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome um, clinical trial, which we had before, thank you, before the pandemic started. So this is quite a lot of data on one slide. Uh, and if you look at the top left here, this is the three dose groups and the Group three had the highest dose, group one had the lowest dose, and so we see a difference in the total antibody response after vaccination depending on the dose. And as we expect, we see a peak response 28 days after vaccination, which then declines. This is completely normal for any post-vaccine or post-infection response. You get a rapid onset of immunity to a strong peak, you get a decline, and then it stops declining and you reach a plateau and the response is then maintained for a year. We looked at neutralizing antibody responses as well. This is shown over here. Um, and we see that the people who had the highest dose had the highest level of neutralizing antibodies against different strains of MERS coronavirus. So that tells us that it's probably worth using the highest dose um, because we can see a real difference in the ability to induce neutralizing antibodies. And we looked at T cell responses where differences between the groups were not significant. And T cell responses peak sooner. This is typical that we see a peak response of 14 days. We do see some responses prior to vaccination. This is because there are four seasonal human coronaviruses that circulate and infect us every year. And they have some similarities with the SARS coronavirus that the T cells can recognize even though the antibodies don't cross neutralize. So low level responses prior to vaccination, which increase at 14 days, again decline and reach a plateau and they don't go back to baseline even a year after vaccination. And again with the um, percent seropositivity, so the, the, the percentage of people who made a detectable antibody response, this is highest with the highest dose group. So this information was really useful when we had to start thinking about making a vaccine quickly against the novel coronavirus. We want to use this design a vaccine, we put the antigen in in the same way, we want the whole spike protein, we don't pre-fusion stabilize it because we don't need to uh, when you deliver it from a, a, a Chadox-1 adenovirus, but we want to use the highest dose. So previously we'd worked on vaccines against outbreak pathogens, thinking of things like the Ebola outbreak that occurred in 2014 and wouldn't that have been better if we could have stopped that quickly before it spread to three countries and, and caused thousands and thousands of deaths. But suddenly we had to start thinking about a pandemic vaccine, which wasn't really what we've been planning for. We've been planning for an outbreak, not a pandemic. So the, the big differences are we have to go faster and we have to go bigger. We definitely need a pharma partner. Somebody has to take on the very large scale manufacturing this vaccine. And although we can manufacture the vaccine for clinical trials in our own campus, there is absolutely no way we can manufacture it enough to supply the world. So we were very lucky to partner with AstraZeneca in April of 2020, and they agreed to produce the vaccine at large scale. And they've now released one and a half billion doses of the vaccine. And they agreed to do it not for profit during the pandemic and not for profit in per perpetuity for low income countries. We also knew, having been involved in the Ebola vaccine uh, development in 2014, 2015, it wasn't enough just to plan the first stages of the vaccine development. In, in that case, vaccine development was very well planned up to phase one trials in West Africa, and then it just kind of stopped because nobody knew how to move on to testing vaccine efficacy, and there was a long gap before that happened. So we were always going to be planning many steps ahead so that we didn't have any pause between getting one data set and being able to move on to the next phase. And that means that we work at risk. 
And this is not risk to the safety of the vaccine recipients. This is financial risk. This is at the earliest opportunity we move to the next stage. So an example of this is in vaccine manufacturing, we would normally make a very small stock of the uh, of the virus that we're going to use as a vaccine, and then we would put it in the freezer while we do a lot of tests on it. Um, and we test for sterility, identity, as well as titer. We make sure that everything is exactly right, the buffer is the right concentration, and so on. And that we always pass all these tests because we have a very good manufacturing team. But normally, we get all those test results, review them all, put them all in the documentation, then say, yes, this is good, let's move to the next stage. Uh, we didn't do that in 2020. We got the seed stock, we immediately started all of the testing, but in parallel we moved on to the next stage of the manufacturing. So as the test results came in, pass this test, pass this test, pass this test, we were already many stages ahead. If any of the tests had failed, we would have had to scrap that work. We've lost money, we've lost time, but none of the tests did fail because we have a very good manufacturing team, so we gained a lot of time. We were a lot further ahead than if we'd done it the normal way and stopped and waited. And that was the approach we took at every stage, and it's the approach AstraZeneca took, because as soon as they licensed the vaccine from us, they moved on to plan very large-scale vaccine manufacturing, working with 25 different partners around the world to have it produced in very large numbers of doses, investing in all of that using so much resource to work with all the different manufacturing supply sites before they knew if the vaccine was going to work. And if they hadn't done that, and we then had the results from our clinical trials which say, yes, this vaccine does work, there would have been no vaccine to use. So we couldn't do that. They had to work at their very large financial risk making a vaccine before they knew if it, if it was a, a vaccine worth using. So that's what I mean by working at risk. So this is something about um, the, the clinical trials that we started on the 23rd of April, 2020, and by that time we had preclinical data and we'd made a batch of vaccine. These are the vials made in our own vaccine manufacturing facility on campus. Um, and all the testing had been done at every stage of the vaccine development process, all the information submitted to the regulators, the MHRA in the UK, for us to have permission to do the trial along with all the ethical approvals that we needed. And we started that trial and we started to generate data. And what you can see here is neutralizing antibody responses on the bottom left here. And what this is showing us is that although we get a neutralizing antibody response induced with one dose, we also had a small group in the trial where we gave them a second dose four weeks later and that neutralizing antibody antibody response went up. And that changed the design of our trials because we already knew we could get an antibody response with one dose, but we didn't know if it would be better if we gave two. And we don't know what level of immune response we need to at this point to control the SARS-CoV-2 virus infection. So clearly we want to go for the strongest response we can get. What we don't want to do is just say, well, we think the low one dose is probably enough. Um, and then discover that it wasn't. So we went for two doses, and that changed the design of the trial. So initially, we had a four-week interval um, between the two doses, but because of vaccine supply issues, because we don't have enough vaccine manufacturing anywhere to produce the vaccine for the trials so early on, we actually we had some people with quite a long gap between doses, and that turned out to be really important. We're also measuring the reactogenicity to the vaccine. That's all of these points in the middle. And this is just showing us that the, the, the events after vaccination are exactly what we've seen before with other Chagas one vectored vaccines. And we're looking at um, binding antibodies increasing and looking at T-cell responses as well. So the big take-home message from this was we want to give two doses. And then we moved on to our phase two trials at the end of May, 28th of May last year. We started expanding the age range of the population that we're testing in two stages, 56 to 69 year olds and then over 70s. And then on the same day, we started our phase three trials because we had enough data from the phase one to start a phase three trial where we look at vaccine efficacy. Does it stop you getting infected? And we did that um, in younger people initially. And then as we got the data from the phase two trials, we added that in um, we added those age groups into phase two. And the clinical development plan eventually became very large because as well as the clinical trials that we were running in the UK, we started working with partners in South Africa and Brazil to test the vaccine in different populations. We always wanted this to be used around the world, so we have to test it around the world because sometimes you get different adverse events and different immune responses in different populations. Um, AstraZeneca did a trial in Japan where it's always required that you have a clinical trial because interestingly, the Japanese um, population tend to respond slightly less well to, to many vaccines, so it's important to look at them separately. 
trial in India run by Serum Institute who were doing some of the manufacturing because again the regulators require a trial to be done in the local population before they'll license it. AstraZeneca took on trials in the US and in South America. Um, and so from our initial phase one study in Oxford, it very quickly became a very large um, clinical development plan around the world. But AstraZeneca were also working on the vaccine manufacturing. They were, didn't have enough sites themselves to manufacture the vaccine. They found 25 different companies who could do this. Sometimes the companies were just doing the last stage of the production, taking bulk drug substance and doing what's called fill and finish, where you dilute it and put it into the final vials. Um, Sometimes they were doing the whole production from, from the seed stock that was supplied initially from our lab. So everything came from, from our lab initially, went through our manufacturing facility, and from there went to all these different manufacturing sites, and some of them were doing the whole manufacturing. And then they looked at um, how to have a network of suppliers around the world to be most efficient in supplying these. And each of these manufacturers has to um, work to achieve the highest yield as well as the highest quality because we want to make sure that we're making the most out of the limited raw materials that are able to make this vaccine. So back to the clinical trials, we have to work out what our endpoints are. So precisely what are we trying to measure when we say, does the vaccine protect you? And different clinical trials have slightly different um, endpoints because they were planned by different people, and that means you can't really compare the outputs of different clinical trials unless they have exactly the same endpoints. So for ours, it was symptomatic PCR positive COVID-19 with at least one of the cough, shortness of breath, fever, loss of smell, loss of taste symptoms, um, and we were only counting those that occurred 15 or more doses after the days after the second dose of vaccine. They had to be seronegative before they were vaccinated. Not everybody in our trials was, but then we excluded those from the analysis. Um, and no prior positive PCR result. That's because we were also doing um, weekly swabbing of our volunteers to pick up asymptomatic infections. And sometimes you could get detection of asymptomatic infections slightly less than 15 days after the second dose, and then it didn't count. Um, so in the initial analysis, we only included two of the clinical trials out of the four because two of them, which were um, South Africa and our initial phase one study, didn't have enough individual cases of COVID in those trials to be included. So for each case, for each person enrolled in the trial who then meets all these criteria, that's adjudicated by an independent panel to check that everything was recorded correctly, and this person truly was a case. And only when you reach uh, an appropriate number of cases across the whole trial do the statisticians then unblind the study and divide people into cases of people who had the COVID vaccine and people who had the meningitis vaccine, and that's when we know if the vaccine works. But you have to have all of the data before you can unblind, and we were just left waiting to see what would happen. So. We were very pleased to see that in the clinical trials, there were no cases of severe COVID um, in the people who got the COVID vaccine, um, and there were, no, there were no deaths, and there were no hospitalizations in people um, who'd had their second dose and reached um, 14 days after the second dose. We did see two hospitalizations um, in people who'd only had the first dose and were less than 21 days from that first dose, but not in anybody who had um, more than 21 days even after the first dose. So immediately we know when we unblind the study, we're getting very good protection against death, against hospitalization, against severe disease. But what about symptomatic disease? Um, and here, the first analysis, 70% efficacy against the symptomatic disease. But it actually turned out to be slightly more complicated than that. Um, and when we looked at the analysis in different parts of the population, there, were, there was a group who'd had a low dose of the vaccine, which was then followed by a higher dose, that's the LDSD group, and they actually had 90% efficacy. Uh, whereas people who'd had two full doses, it was 60%. So if you aggregate all of that information, it comes out with 70% efficacy, but there were clearly some differences. Uh, and it took a little while to understand why, but it turns out that it's not the low dose first that matters, it's the long interval between the two doses. So whereas in Brazil, they stuck to a very precise four-week interval in the UK, where we'd started earlier and had been waiting for vaccine supply, some people had had a much longer interval between the two doses. It turned out they have a higher immune response and they have better efficacy. So the vaccine was approved, 
uh, and started to be used in the UK, but immediately from vaccine, the beginning of vaccine rollout, it was recommended to give the two doses three months apart to get the benefit of that improved immune response and improved efficacy with a longer interval. And we were then able to provide data on this. So this is just looking at efficacy after the first dose. And um, from 22 to 30 days after the first dose, you see 76% vaccine efficacy. And that doesn't really vary when you go out to 90 days. In the group from 90 to 120 days, it's reported as a drop in efficacy, but actually that's because there's very small numbers, and if you look, there's very wide confidence intervals there. So we can't really be sure of the efficacy between 90 and 120 days, but in any case, the recommendation is to give the second dose at 84 days, so we're within that 90-day window. So from 22 to 90 days, average efficacy 76%, and, and no decline up to at least 90 days. And we then looked at the effect of that increased dose on efficacy after the second dose. And you can see in the last column that as the interval between the doses increases, the efficacy after the second dose also increases. Again, supporting the decision to leave a longer interval between the two doses um, than we had originally planned in the clinical trials. So that was good to know. But then we started to get vaccine effectiveness data. So we measure efficacy in clinical trials, but then once the vaccine is used in the, in the population, in, in real life, if you like, in people who aren't in the trials, but just having the vaccine, um, that's vaccine effectiveness data. And the first data that came through was from the oldest members of the population, because that's when the vaccine, that was who was giving the vaccine. And by um, March of this year, we were able to see um, in people over the age of 70 in England who just received their first dose, a 60% protection against symptomatic PCR positive disease. That was true of both the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, which was also being used. And in the over 80s, hospitalization was reduced by 80%, again, true of both vaccines. And we saw that deaths in the over 80s were reducing faster than that in the younger age groups, which had not yet been vaccinated. So this was all very good news that even the oldest members of society, we were getting very good protection from even the first dose of the vaccine. That was, of course, with the original variant. And we went on to have to think about um, uh, other variants which are now more transmissible and, and make our lives more difficult. But the MHRA in the UK was the first to license a vaccine. It's gone on to be licensed in many countries. Um, there is a little gap in the middle of Europe there that you might be able to see on the slide. Um, but it's licensed in many countries and it also has WHO pre-qualification approval, which means that even though countries such as many countries in Africa that don't have their own regulatory bodies, they can work with the WHO approval. So as a result of that, it's now in use in over 170 countries. Because this vaccination doesn't require frozen storage, just refrigerated storage, that means it can feed directly into existing supply chains for vaccines because most vaccines that are used around the world require refrigeration. So this vaccine feeds into that same supply network, which makes it much easier to use in countries with high ambient temperatures. But then the variants came along and we had to start thinking about, well, do the vaccines work against the variants? And the answer is yes, they do. So again, here is um, data from Public Health England, which confusingly has also changed its name. It's now UK Health Security Agency. Um, and we see here the vaccine efficacy against hospitalization with the alpha variant and the delta variant after one or two doses of Pfizer and AstraZeneca. So two doses of AstraZeneca, we've got 92% vaccine effectiveness against the delta variant and 86% against alpha. Um, and the delta variant is the one obviously that's taken over and is now dominant everywhere in the world. Um, this was after adjusting for age and, and so on. And also against symptomatic disease, we're still seeing efficacy, effectiveness of the vaccine against symptomatic disease um, after two doses. This is more data on um, antibody responses with a very long interval between the two doses. So in the middle of this graph, if I can make the pointer work, I don't think I can. Um, that, that line in the centre is the, is the day at which the second dose is given. Um, and the reason that there's a different gap is because some people had a uh, much longer, a 44 to 45 gap between the first dose and the second dose. And what we see is the longer in the interval between the first and the second dose, the higher the antibody response is after the second dose. So if you're able to wait a long time, you get an even better antibody response when you give the second dose. The immune system's had time to develop the memory, and then when it, you come back with the second dose, you get a stronger response. 
We've also been able to show that you get boosting after a third dose. So there was initially concern that because this is an adenovirus-affected vaccine, if you give it even twice, it wouldn't do anything the second time because you'll develop antibodies against the vector, but it turns out not to be true. Um, so here we're looking at the antibody response 28 days after the first dose, and then after the second dose, it's higher. If we wait for um, between 28 and 30 weeks, there's a slight decline after the second dose, but it doesn't go down as low as it was after the first dose, then it increases uh, again after the third dose. So we can keep reusing the vector in the same people. We're now starting to get data on um, heterologous boosting, so one vaccine to prime and one vaccine to boost. And this is important to know about for a number of different reasons. The data is actually really complicated. This is just the first data set of two vaccines at a four-week interval, and the data is still, we're still waiting on data on a 12-week interval. It may not be the same story if you leave a longer gap between the vaccines. And all of this is feeding into policy decisions about how to use vaccines for boosters um, and which are the best combinations to use. We also started working on updated versions of the vaccine with variant spike proteins. We started thinking about this at the end of last year. So instead of being able to take time off for Christmas and New Year, we had to start working on setting up a pipeline to make new versions of the vaccine. So any platform technology that's being used can be updated quickly. We could go quickly in the first place and we can go quickly to update. But what happened was that it was originally uh, developed in Oxford and we needed to transfer the entire process from the very beginning over to AstraZeneca. So we've done that now. Then they're able to produce a new version with whichever antigen in they want. And we've been looking at um, some data from preclinical studies and now there's a clinical trial going on of the beta spike, um, either in people who haven't been vaccinated at all or people who had two doses of the original vaccine. So we don't have the clinical data yet, but we do have some data from immunizing mice. And what we're looking at here is neutralizing antibodies. On the left of each box, mice have had one dose of the original vaccine. And then on the right, one dose of the original vaccine followed by one of the beta variant vaccine. And you can see against the beta virus, you get a big increase when you give the second dose, but that's also true of the original virus. And it's also true of the kappa variant and it's true of the delta variant. So when we give beta vaccine second, we get really broad antibody responses against all of these variants. So we don't need to develop vaccines against all of these variants. Alternatively, if we give a comparison of two doses of the original vaccine to one dose of the original and one of the beta variant, again, we see in most cases a stronger neutralizing antibody titer when it's the beta variant second, but actually we still see strong neutralizing antibodies with two doses of the original vaccine. So it's not true to think that for every new variant that comes along, we're going to have to have a new vaccine, because actually what we're seeing is that the strongest immune responses are also the broadest immune responses, and we get very good protection. So this is preclinical data so far. We still await the clinical data to see if that's true when we test it in humans. So I'm going to stop there. This is bringing us up to date on, on what we're working on now. And I'll just leave you with my acknowledgement slide. And we really must thank all of the clinical trial volunteers that came forward and took part in these studies. Our funders um, the, and the trial site in, uh, investigators um, at the 19 different clinical trial sites across the UK, six in Brazil and two in South Africa, who all worked incredibly quickly as well as incredibly, um, to incredibly high standards to deliver the data to find out if the vaccine was effective. Because in my lab, if we produce a vaccine very quickly and get it manufactured into the first clinical trial, and then there's a slowdown and nobody gets the phase three trial done, we don't have a vaccine. So the whole um, discovery development process has to work together to make everything move on as quickly as possible. And, and it did, and that's how we got a vaccine in a year. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a very inspiring talk, and uh, we can see the, the effort <laughs> put into the, the effort uh, the, in this uh, great, uh, you know, achievement. So what I, we are going to do now is uh, a round table uh, where uh, Sara will be one of the participants, Anik uh, Shevio will be 
the other participants. She is a journalist at Heidi News. And uh, the round table is going to be mediated by Emmanuel Barraud from EPFL Mediacom. Uh, maybe I can let you move you. toward the, the chairs there. <laughs> you are done adjusting your microphone. Now, uh, the audience who is interested, those of you who are interested in asking questions to either uh, Sara or Anik, you can uh, scan the QR code. This will lead you to a Google form where you can put your question in. And uh, at the end of the round table, we will try to take some of your questions. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Luisa. And thank you for this, for this talk. It was really an impressive race that you, that you did mm -hmm. last year. Is it fair to say now that it is a little thanks to you that the UK has been allowed to remove almost all restrictions today? Uh, we, we have few restrictions. We still have recommendations for mask wearing, particularly in public transport and in some places of employment. Um, but schools are more or less back to normal. And um, people have been able to go back to work when they've been working at home for a long time. Mm -hmm. And what is the situation in hospitals at the moment? Well, we, so we still have a very high case rate at the moment. Um, we don't have the same relationship between the number of cases and the number of hospitalizations because a lot of what's happening now is that a lot of people who've been vaccinated are getting infected, but they have really mild disease. Mm -hmm. It's just like a cold. But um, there are still hospitalizations. So currently we have about 7,000 people in hospital with COVID, and that's really higher than it should be. Mm -hmm. And so that, what would be the, the, the best solution to get that? We, we've been talking about going back to normal or somewhat normal. Is the new normal going to be with COVID forever, you think? Or are we going to get rid of that disease? Uh, we're not going to get rid of the disease. We're going to have to learn how to, to live with it. So, um, as I said before, there are four coronaviruses that regularly infect us um, and cause a cold. And we get infected with them in childhood, in early childhood, and we have a mild disease because it doesn't infect affect young children very seriously mm -hmm. and we develop some immunity and then we get exposure to it throughout life and the only time these other coronaviruses cause any problem is if there's an outbreak in for example a nursing home where there are a lot of people with compromised immune systems and that's really the only time it's even identified if a lot of people in the same place have quite severe infections. Um, most of the time we're being infected and we don't even know about it so SARS-CoV-2 will eventually fall into that category. What's not entirely clear is how we go from where we are now to get to that point. Some people think by spring we'll be there. I don't know if that's being a bit too optimistic. I think we will eventually get to that point where everybody's um, been vaccinated and younger children have had the mild infections that you expect with coronaviruses and everybody's built up sufficient immunity. And again, we just have to think about the people who have compromised immune systems. But there are, because of all the research that's happened on SARS-CoV-2, we now have um, a drug that looks quite promising. We have um, monoclonal antibodies and some of them are long-acting monoclonal antibodies. So there are also other ways of protecting those people if their immune system isn't strong enough to respond to a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, more or less, it should become like some other diseases that are here, but that do not that much harm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's what we can hope for. The, the, the whole 2020 year has been about waves of COVID in different places, not at the same speed everywhere. This was also a big challenge for the media to, to, to explain what was going on, because when we think it, we, we thought it was good, good for this part of the world, then it ro rose up again here and there. How do you, as a, as a media, talking about health and talking about science, how do you react to those, uh, how, to those waves and how do you manage the, 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 the information that you give to your readers? The, fir the first thing and really difficult for us is to manage the flow because there is so many informations coming from everywhere. And that was the first thing. So we, we managed to make a board of 10 topics. And we decide to have these 10 questions. Actually, it was 10 questions. And if one of the answer on this board was no, we didn't make the, an article about this. It helped us to stay focused on science and health 
And uh, we have a science uh, redactors in, in IDNU, so they were making, um, uh, looking all the papers and all that really important stuff. And I was more on clinical trails and uh, medical issues on uh, uh, COVID. So you, you have noticed and probably told your readership that those clinical trials, which we've had a very good uh, explanation before, was uh, made much faster than ever before. Did you have some feedback from your readers uh, that, was, that were concerned about this speed of the, of the clinical trials and the fact that it's, it was too short to really have uh, solid information about what was going on? I think we... We explain that it's science, uh, it's science on the way, and then it's not a, a final cut. And now we we know that, but we 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 quite often said it's ongoing. It's not finished. It's ongoing, and that that's really important to do that. But still, now we have people writing us about an article we wrote in April 2020, and they said, you wrote this, but it's wrong. I said, yes, but you have to put in the context again. In April 2020, it was like, uh, that. like that, but now it's different. Mm -hmm. well, well, on the science point of view, you also need some, some time to, to change the recommendation, or you have new observations, new studies. Um, how do you make sure that it's always the, the, the most up-to-date information that is transmitted to the community? Well, that's the difficult thing to achieve because the information does develop over time and recommendations can change. So one good example, I think, of this where communication hasn't been great is vaccination of pregnant women. So with any new drug, any new vaccine, pregnant women will not be in the first tranche of people to be vaccinated. And ideally, we would be doing separate clinical trials in pregnant women um, to assess the safety and the outcomes. Um, SARS was spreading around the world so quickly. So healthcare workers who were pregnant were really very much at risk from the disease because it's, it's more serious in pregnant women than non-pregnant women of the same age. And so based on an assessment of the technology that was being used, um, some, some groups did decide to, to recommend that pregnant healthcare workers were being vaccinated because the, the risk-benefit analysis for them was that they were much more at, uh, at risk from catching the disease than, um, than receiving the vaccine. But people who weren't at risk of being exposed to the virus at that stage weren't recommended to take the vaccine when pregnant. Over time, we've got a lot more data. We have the data from the pregnant healthcare workers who've been vaccinated, and we see that it's very safe in them. We have the usual reproductive toxicology studies that are always done with new drugs and new vaccines that shows nothing to worry about there. We also have... Um, data on women who became pregnant during the clinical trials, so we were able to show there's no impact on fertility. There have been independent studies done at IVF clinics of women who were either not vaccinated, vaccinated, or had been infected and recovered, and there was no difference in the IVF, IVF success between those three different groups. So now, there is a very strong recommendation that all pregnant women should be vaccinated. In fact, ideally, they'd be vaccinated before they were pregnant because everybody should be being, every adult should be being vaccinated anyway. But if not, then pregnant women should be vaccinated. But this message is not getting through. I think some people are still stuck on the, oh, we don't know if it's safe yet in pregnancy. A lot of um, midwives in the UK have been reluctant to recommend vaccination. Um, but we're now in a situation where we have quite a lot of pregnant women in hospital with severe COVID uh, that wouldn't be there if they'd been vaccinated. So we need to make sure that we explain that recommendations that were given very early can change over time. Okay, but this is also about having the trust of people, right? And people need to trust what they see and what they read. How, how, how do we do to, to have the readers trust what's written in the media? The really things that's really difficult for, for us, we, we are speci specialized journalists, we are not main, um, main, mainstream uh, um, journalism or media. Uh, the thing is that when we write an article, we, we know that people, they are a, a level of science field or background, they are enough to understand what we are writing. But sometimes we have ref um, questions from people reading ID news and they didn't understand what we are writing. And that means there is a gap between the general population not being able to understand the scientific um, articles or publication and 
we are the, the in between. And so we, we have to think how people, having no scientific knowledge, they can understand the things, actually. And sometimes they, we, we, we give a message, but we are not responsible the way the people getting the message and the interpretation. Okay. And uh, with the social media, and um, I don't know how to say that in English, but the corona septic, the, the complotist, and the people bringing a lot of fake news on the, on the social media that make our work really, really, really difficult. And uh, that's not easy to convince. The role of journalists is not to convince, it's, it's to speak about facts. And um, there is a, a, dif a bit, big difference between facts and opinion. And uh, on vaccine or treatment for COVID, we, are, we cannot have opinion. We have to write facts. But the people, they are really challenging us with their believing. And what, what, what can you say to somebody believing God doesn't exist when you, you can prove God exists? It's not easy. About opposing facts, some of these corona sceptics say that all this is about business and money for the pharmaceutical companies. You just told us that AstraZeneca was producing this vaccine as a non-profit operation. When you're on the researcher's side, you say, okay, we have a disease, terrible disease, we need to make a vaccine, so you rush, you don't count your hours. What, what is your mindset when you're trying to address a pandemic like this one? As a, as a vaccinologist. What is this? Sorry? The, the, your mindset. What, okay. What do, yeah. So I'd been working on um, development of vaccines against the outbreak pathogens for years and wanting to have the opportunity to test the vaccines and see if they work or not. Um, because normally there's a small amount of money available, we do a little bit of work and we stop. This is another reason why vaccine development for these diseases goes so slowly, because we do a little bit of work and then we run out of money and we stop. And we have to present the results and then try to raise money to do the next stage of the research, which is always more because it's bigger. And so we'd done the early phase trials 12 times, different vaccines. We shows that it was going as we expected, but we hadn't had the opportunity to go and find out if the vaccines work and can protect people. And so in a pandemic where everything has to move so much faster, finally this looked like this was the opportunity to put everything that we'd worked on into practice. We'd already done all the different parts of this, and we'd taken part to a certain extent in the Ebola vaccine trials in 2014, um, and then seen that work just stopped because nobody knew how to do the vaccine efficacy trial. So we were thinking about how to do all of this and um, move through all the steps as quickly as possible. And then this was our chance to do it. So of course, all of the team who worked on these things for a long time, we all took that opportunity and did everything that we could. Okay, a very operational question. How do you recruit the volunteers for the, for the first stage trials? Uh, we use a website to advertise. Uh, we make certain information available. This is all approved by the Ethical Committee and people can read that and decide if they want to volunteer for the trial. That's the basic information like which age group we're looking for, which cities we're looking for, because we don't want people... This was in a pandemic. We didn't want people traveling a long way around the country, so you had to live close to the vaccination site, which disappointed a lot of people because they're saying, well, where's my clinical trial site? I want to take part as well. So then if they respond to that, then they then there were phone interviews to ask more um, about the suitability of the person for the trial and to give them more information and if they're still um, acceptable and want to go ahead then they come into the clinic and they have a um, they watch the videos about the trial and make sure they have all the information about what's going on they decide if they want to take part in the trial if they do they sign the consent form and they get the vaccine and then they go through all the follow-up procedures there's quite a lot of blood taking particularly in the early um, phase trials we take you know i was showing you data at the immune response at seven, 14, 28 days after vaccination, each of those is a blood sample. And then we decided we're giving everybody a second dose, more blood samples, and then can you come back at six months? Can you come back a year? So there's, there's quite a burden. And then a lot of the people in the trials were doing weekly swabbing. They were swabbing their noses every week and then posting off the swabs to see what the vaccine efficacy was against asymptomatic infection. And we found that there was some efficacy against asymptomatic infection, as you might expect, not as good as against symptomatic infection. But that was 
another really useful piece of information. So the volunteers were fantastic and we were overwhelmed with the response at every stage. We always had far more volunteers than we needed. Wonderful. We have a few minutes left, so we can take a few questions that came from the audience. Thank you very much for participating. Um, well, I will start, start with the first one who uh, asks you if you have a comment about this, um, this report of blood clotting that has been linked at some point to the, to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, so that, that's not something, so the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome is something that appeared only after the clinical trials had finished because it's a very rare adverse event and in the tens of thousands of people we vaccinated in the clinical trials it didn't occur. You only see that kind of thing when you start to get tens of millions of people vaccinated. And again, that was a developing situation. Uh, what's become clearer is that um, it affects younger people more than older people. And so in the UK, the recommendation was used not to use this vaccine in people under the age of 40, but it's still used in older people, where the rate of the blood clotting is, is not different from um, the background rate, from what normally happens anyway. And um, another point is that it, if it's going to happen, it happens after the first dose, not after the second. So people have had one dose and not experienced this are good to go for their second dose or their third dose. Um, and more recently, information is arising about the rates of this syndrome in different parts of the world. And it's not equal across different parts of the world. In fact, in some parts of the world, it doesn't occur at all. So I don't know if you remember the, the swine flu vaccine in 2009. Narcolepsy was a, an adverse event after vaccination that particularly affected Nordic countries in Northern Europe and, and not other parts of the world. So it's not unprecedented to see that these rare adverse events can affect particular populations or geographies and not everywhere. We don't know fully whether that's all down to genetics or to environment or to some interaction of the two, but it looks like a similar picture may be an unfolding for the TTS syndrome. And again, there's, there's more to know. It's very rare. Um, it, the impact of it was lessened by good monitoring after vaccination, because if it's picked up early, it's easier to treat, but it's still something we're gathering information about. Interesting, thank you very much. There are two questions which I will merge into one. How does this COVID experience change or accelerate the, the research for other vaccines against, another, against other diseases? Well, we have a lot more technical information now. So in theory, we should be able to go more quickly with developing vaccines against all the other diseases. In practice, though, that's not happening because we don't have the money to do it yet. So that's my next job, to try to raise the money to get back to the work on the other outbreak diseases because we really want to be able to control an outbreak before it has the opportunity to become a pandemic. Every time a virus is transmitted from one person to the other, it has an opportunity to mutate, to involve, evolve and become more transmissible. And we really don't want to give more viruses the opportunity to do that. Thank you. A question that is more for Anik. Um, how important is it in a, in a media to have scientists or at least people that are really uh, at ease with science questions? It makes really easier and faster to understand what we are reading and what is happening. When we, when, when we saw the strain, we already knew who we want to call to make an interview with because we knew that in, in the USA there is a, a research, uh, research and um, a very, I, I don't have the name just right now, but uh, we know whom and where we can reach people to get answer and reliable answer. And for the medical part is exactly the same. When you know where he's, um, who he is uh, in charge of the uh, laboratory in Switzerland, it's in Geneva, in the Hôpital Universitaire de Genève, and you know it's Laurent Kaiser, it's, it makes easier and faster to deliver the, the, the messages. And the second part is to have, um, how do you say that? In, um, um, sorry, I don't have the word. It's an, an expertise. When you read science uh, articles during your all ten, the last 10 years, you get use of it and you can see where, where they are the points and you can ask the right questions actually. That means that, that we can go deeper, faster and we can make real, real, reliable information. Thank you very much. Um, I will take one last question because time is moving very fast uh, and it's 
related to the award that you will officially receive in a few minutes. How do we encourage women to start and then stay in science? Did you face any obstacle due to being a woman in your okay, so, career? So in biology and medicine, actually many, many women go into science as a career. And um, we did some analysis of the people who worked on the COVID vaccine in 2020. Um, 230 authors on the first publication came from Oxford. And of those, two thirds were women unless you get to the professorial level, in which case two-thirds were men. So we have really good representation of women at all levels up to the very high. So we still have some work to do, but I think that's good progress coming from where things used to be. You know, we have a lot of senior researchers, senior medical people working on the clinical trials. It's just the very top level. Um, I don't think it's easy for anybody to, to progress in a scientific career. It's always hard. I think one thing that we've suffered from in the past is um, people tending to recruit people that they identify with to be their successors, and that's why it's taking a while to kind of get the cohort of women moving through the different levels. It's not something that can be fixed overnight, but I think there's much more recognition of this now, and um, we've heard today about you know the initiative to appoint more women professors directly. Um, that's something that needs to happen everywhere, and, and we are still starting to see it happen, but there is still some way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for this very inspiring discussion. And now, Louise, I think you will take the, the floor again from here for the award ceremony. Please join me in thanking uh, uh, Sarah, Anik and Emmanuel for this round table and uh, really, I think, an interesting uh, set of questions were asked also from the audience. Thank you for sending in your, your questions. And I think we are now at the moment in which we are giving our award. So I we have to ask where he wants us to be, but we would like to present to Professor Dama Dames Sarah Gilbert for her groundbreaking work in vaccine development, the Erna Hamburger Prize 2021. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. For this foundation, we also have a small gift for you. Uh, thank you very much. Switzerland thank you. And flowers. And flowers. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, and congratulations. Let me thank hold you. something for yes. you. <laughs> I'll leave the flowers with you. Why do you come here and take a picture? Do you want to? Ah, that look. <laughs> Thank you. Et voilà. Donc, as they say around here, now. <laughs> I would like to invite you all to join us for a cocktail just on the other side of uh, these curtains. But before I do that, I would like to thank everybody who made this uh, event possible, starting from Valérie. <laughs> Alexandra, who really helped tirelessly. and Mediacom for the support throughout the, the process. Thank you very much for being here. It was a pleasure. And please join us for our cocktail. Thank you very much. <laughs>